Hey everyone, welcome to Exploring Health Macro to Micro. I'm your host, Parker Condit. In this show, I interview health and wellness experts around topics like sleep, exercise, nutrition, mental health, stress management, and much more. So by the end of each episode, you'll have concrete, tangible advice that you can start implementing today to start living a healthier life, either for yourself or for your loved ones. And that's the micro side of the show. The macro side of the show is discussing larger systemic issues that contribute to health outcomes. An example of that is the fact that most major cities only have a three-day supply of food at any given time, which is an incredibly vulnerable position to be in societally. So for a variety of reasons, uh, a shift towards regenerative farming, urban farming, and individuals growing their own food is a solution that provides resilience with much better long-term sustainability. This, along with soil quality, are two topics that I've become much more interested in over the past few months. We all know that eating nutritious food is very important, but with dwindling soil quality, our food is becoming less and less nutritious, not to mention the environmental impact of factory farming. So here to discuss all of that today with me is Greg Peterson. And when it comes to anything around urban farming, Greg is kind of a legend in the space, so I'm very thankful to have him on. In 2003, he founded UrbanFarm.com, which is an online portal for urban farming education. And in 2015, he created the Urban Farm Podcast. His vision with the podcast is to help spread awareness and education about growing your own food. In this episode, we go over how fragile our current food environment is, why soil quality is such a driving factor for nutritional quality in our food, how you can start your own urban farm, even if you have limited space, like a porch, like me, and what harvesting rainwater is and how you can use that for your garden. And what might surprise you is that uh, the urban farm that Greg started all those years ago was only on a third of an acre, so not a huge plot of land. And it was here in Phoenix, which is where I live, and also an area that I would have thought would be very challenging to kind of grow anything. But as you'll see throughout this conversation, it's very possible as long as you work in alignment with the environment. So without further delay, please enjoy my conversation with Greg Peterson. Greg, really excited to have you on here. We're going to be talking a lot about urban uh, urban farming, sustainability. And I think the easiest place to start is just getting a brief introduction to what exactly urban farming is. And then we'll get into some of the wider implications around the food system, climate change, and things like that. But if you could just start us off with how you define urban farming, I think that'd be a great start for us. So I'm going to step back and tell you that I have spent my life, I'm 61 years old, I've spent my life in the food scene, in the local food scene, and figuring out local food systems. And um, I discovered early on in my life that uh, we have a food system problem. And I have addressed it by building out systems so people can farm in the city, because I believe that the place that we solve our food insecurity problems is in the city. So uh, urban farming is where it's at for me. And it can be as small as some pots on your front porch to, you know, acres in an urban area. Uh, Bob McClendon out in West Phoenix has many acres that he farms. So can you define food insecurity so people have context around what exactly that means? Um, well, there's so the, the and I, I, when I spoke that, it's, I, I almost paused myself, but food insecurity is people not having enough food to supply their daily needs. And there is a significant amount of people in this country that are food insecure. They're not getting three meals a day. Um, And so that's one piece of it. And uh, interestingly, about 20 years ago, I was watching the Today Show and they had this segment on where the this family, three generations were living in this small house in some southern town and um, they didn't have enough food. And I looked at that segment and they had all this dirt around their house. It's like, man, you need to be growing your own food. You could grow enough food in that the amount of property that you have to feed your family. So there's that piece that's food insecurity part. And then there's our food system challenges, which we saw really clearly when COVID hit. 
especially, you know, things missing out of the grocery store. Like, uh, I know obviously it's not food, but toilet paper, you know, it's a food. Those are food system issues there. Yeah. I think what you're alluding to is the, how vulnerable our system is. And that kind of got exposed in 2020. Um, can you explain, let me see, we don't have, there's an, is there enough food in the country for everyone? That's not the problem, is it? (sighs) That's a really good question. And it really depends on how you define food. Um, is there enough nourishment, um, you know, from the perspective of good food for people? Probably not. Is there enough manufactured food? Maybe, but people still aren't getting it. And when I say manufactured is when they take corn and they make corn chips or, you know, all of the boxed things that you find at the grocery store. Yeah. So I've always, when thinking about this problem, it's like, you can't just always think about food quality. It's like when people are struggling to not even know where their next meal is coming from, you need to first think about quantity. Like, is Like, can you just get them food? And then once there's a consistent level of food available, then we can start trying to optimize for quality. Yeah. Um, and as I've understood it, there is enough food in this country. It's just a lot of it. I forget like the actual terms. I don't know the supply chain terms, but once mm-hmm. it's in our homes, that's where most of it gets wasted. Yeah. There, there is a lot of food waste. Um, and you know, I suspect that people that are food insecure have less food waste. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, they're probably more conscious about what they eat and what they throw away. Yep, I'm sure. So let's go back to the idea of urban farming. Uh, we're going to kind of keep weaving in and out of a handful of these topics. Okay. Uh, you lived in Phoenix for a long time. I live in Scott- years. Right. So I live in Scottsdale. Uh, so I kind of wanted to base this conversation around what a lot of people would probably think of as like a very tough, uh, climate for farming where uh-huh. it's very hot and it's very dry here, but you've shown it's possible. So oh, can yeah. you just, can you just walk through an example of like what you had at your property? And then we can kind of, I want to end up digging into examples very selfishly of what I can do in a condo with two patios, one sun facing, one not. Um, just so people have like concrete examples of like what we're talking about here. Yeah. So, um, the property that I lived on for 32 years was a third of an acre, approximately 80 feet wide by 160 feet deep. And I built over that 32 year period, a, what what I called a old growth food forest. And basically what that means is that there's, there's always food to eat there. In fact, I've been gone coming up on two years now and I visited it, uh, visited the property last month and they're still maintaining it. And an old, the old growth food forest part means that there's always just food to eat. You know, you walk out into your front and backyard and there were citrus to eat or lettuce growing wild in the yard. So there were dozens of things that would just come back year after year after year. So how did you start that? Was there already uh, fruit trees there when you started or how did you start facilitating this this old growth food forest? Um, there was so the property that I owned when I was in Phoenix. um was on an old citrus orchard from the 1920s. So when I arrived there, there were about a half a dozen citrus trees and that was it. And uh, I bought it because it had flood irrigation. And that basically means that the water uh, just shows up and 26 times a year, you get six inches of water in your yard. And I purposely bought it for that. And, um, you know, that having that kind of water supply, that, um, helped a lot. And uh, then what I did over time is I just planted fruit trees. I I, I love planting fruit trees that, the, because you plant it once and you get food for decades. There were two citrus trees at the urban farm that had been producing fruit for a hundred years when I left. That's amazing. Yeah. What, what, what kind of fruit was it? It was Arizona sweet oranges. Okay. Arizona sweet oranges. So, you know, on any given year, I was getting peaches, apricots, plums, jujubes, 
citrus, about a dozen different kinds of citrus, uh, apples. Um, you know, there was nine months a year, there was food to eat out of the property. And what I've noticed is, so I now live in Asheville, North Carolina. So we have a winter and uh, as we're recording this, it's middle December and there's not much growing outside. In fact, it was uh, 18 degrees out this morning. And th this is kind of reminiscent for me of a growing season that, like we had in Phoenix, but it was, it's opposite. So the growing season that I have here is March through November. The growing season that we have in Phoenix is October through end of June. So we're still taking two to three months off. It's just a different time of year. And it's actually, going back to your question, it's actually quite easy to grow things in Arizona if you just pay attention to the seasons and when you're growing. In fact, Bob McClendon, I mentioned him earlier, um, he, about 15 years ago, he just came out and said, I just don't grow in July, August, and September. It's just not worth it. That makes sense. Yeah. So I don't necessarily have a green thumb. I've been able to, over the past few years, keep some houseplants alive, which I'm very proud of. Yeah. But, so how much harder is it growing uh, some sort of fruit? I just got a fig tree, a little fig tree. So in a pot. Yep. Yeah. Um, so how much harder is it growing these things in the desert? Yeah. Well, I'm just now experiencing growing things in uh, not the desert, and it seems a lot harder for me here than it did in Phoenix. Interesting. It seems very counterintuitive. This just seems like it would be a hard place to grow or keep anything alive. Well, and interestingly for me, I actually started my first garden in Phoenix in 1975. And I moved here. So I'd been growing for about 45 or 46 years. I've been growing gardens in Phoenix and I moved here and I was talking with, uh, uh, Zach Brooks from Arizona worm farm. He's in, uh, you know, in West Phoenix. And he said, he reminded me because my garden, the first year I arrived here was bad. It was, you know, it wasn't anything I would have expected to be bad wise because hell, I've been growing for over 40 years. I've had over 40 seasons of gardens in my life. And he reminded me, he said, Greg, don't forget your first garden is your worst garden. So I'm having to relearn how to grow things here because of the different climate. Um, but you know, I had 40 plus gardens and garden seasons in Phoenix. And so it's just, it's simple. And the big thing is, is paying attention to the seasons, you know, make sure we have our planting calendar that we give away for free at plantingcalendar.org. And it's a planting calendar specifically for the low desert. And you cannot count on big box stores and nurseries to sell you a plant that is in the correct season. So planting a broccoli in March, forget it. Planting a watermelon in September, forget it. They're just not going to work. So once you get those pieces figured out, it makes it a whole lot easier. I can imagine. All right. So there is a fair amount of research that's going to have to go into this first. I can't just start buying plants and hoping they, they uh, produce food in the way that I'd want them to. Well, we do have our Growing Food the Basics course online, and it takes you through seven lessons on how to do that. It takes you through watering and garden placement and, you know, all that stuff. So um, Great. that resource is available. I'll definitely go through that, and I will definitely link to that in the show notes for this as well. Um, all right. So if you can, if you could get more people involved in urban, in urban farming, mm -hmm. what sort of problems do you think you start to solve at like the local food economy level? What problems do we solve? Yeah. Well, so at any given moment, there was a, uh, uh, let me sidestep here a little bit. Um, about 15, 18 years ago, there was an, uh, some research done uh, out of the UK um, that determined that any urban area on the planet has about a three day supply of food. I've heard that before. And I'm like, that's scary. That can't be true, but it probably is. <laughs> it is because what we, we have an absolutely beautiful 
food delivery system in this country. It delivers enough food to get people fed mostly, but it only has about a three day supply. It's basically, it's, it's a just in time system. So it's, Mm -hmm. it has just what it, what we have in the grocery stores. So if there's a trucker strike, if there's a storm, if there's COVID, it, it disrupts that. And that's the big issue that we have to deal with. And that's the piece that urban farming growing in the, you know, growing in our fronts and backyards that solves it. Yeah. So it sounds like it just creates a little bit more resiliency in the system. A little bit or a lot, you know, Cuba for many years grew a lot of their own food right in the city. You know, when the the whole thing happened in the late sixties and they just started growing food right in the cities. And so you asked me a question a little while ago. I want to kind of tease it apart a little bit more. What is an urban farmer? And my description of an urban farmer is um, you grow food, you share it. That's it. Okay. (laughs) So you, you know, you grow food. For your family and you're sharing it with your family, you can call yourself an urban farmer. And then the third piece of that is name your farm. Okay. So pretty easy or maybe not easy, but simple three-step process. Exactly. And the reason you want to name your farm, I I named my farm 20 plus years at 25 years ago, called it the urban farm. And it's known in Phoenix. The urban farm is a known place. And I encouraged people that went on tours to the urban farm to name their farms as well, because what it does, I was at a tour one day and how many people have, you know, how many people have named their farms? And I get, you know, five or 10 people that say, and, you know, it's like Jack's Beanstalk. It's like two fat cats, apartment gardens. What it's doing is it's bringing some levity to it and um, notoriety. Oh, you're a farmer, you're growing food. And it can be really super simple. And the next step is grow food in your front and backyard. And this is a great small business for stay-at-home moms or dads, high school students, where you're growing food in your front and backyard and then taking it to a farmer's market. Or, you know, one of the things that I did this year is we grew way, way, way too many tomatoes. We were harvesting five to 10 pounds of tomatoes every other day out of my new, uh, you know, the, the orchard that I planted this year. And I just put a sign down on the street and I said, or free organic tomatoes. Um, and you know, the people on the street loved me for it. I can imagine. Um, yeah. And, and the other piece of it is, is that I've said this for years. The only place that lack lives is between our ears, because when you look at the sheer abundance that comes from fruit trees or tomato plants or cucumbers or the, you know, it's, it makes so much abundance and we just need to be revisiting that in our front and backyard. When I was in Croatia in 2014, I went there on a food systems project with Arizona State University and every single front yard had food growing in it. I did. I did. Everybody was growing food in it. And that was like, all right, well, there's something to learn here. That's like a big wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You mentioned abundance. And since I first got in touch with you about coming on the show, I've been looking up um, more about the urban farm. And I saw that you did have many orange trees on there. And recently I started, uh, squeezing my own orange juice here. Oh, nice. Yeah. But now that I saw, like, I think it was your orange trees that you were referencing that you've had for, or that have been growing fruit for a hundred years. Yeah. Right. So a single tree just needs water and sunlight. Right. Um, so just knowing that in my head now, I'm like, I hate buying oranges. Like it feels, <laughs> and it's like the amount of energy that probably went into wherever they were grown, maybe yeah. Florida to get them here seems insane. And when you start breaking it down for like, that's just oranges, like how, how much energy goes into how far all of our food has to travel along that very incredible supply chain that you were mentioning that sort of stocks our food or our food system yeah. for only three days at a time. There's a name for this. It's called food miles. Yeah. Do you have okay. any idea 
so food miles is the amount of miles that food travels from where it was grown to where it was consumed. Okay. Any idea what the average food miles in the United States is? It's probably a disgustingly high number. 1,500. Yep. So half the country. <laughs> 1,500 miles. Yeah. And so there is that piece, but there's also another piece that's really important that people need to know about. And that's the, the oranges that you're eating from the grocery store, the peaches that you're eating from the grocery store aren't as nutritious as the ones that you're picking off of your own trees. Here's why. Because what happens is, is they have to pick those fruit early. And the moment they pick that fruit, it starts degrading nutritionally. But the other side of the coin is, is that when they pick that fruit, they're picking it early. So it's not as nutritionally dense or sweet as it could be. So I, uh, three or four years ago, I handed my friend, uh, Tony, a bag of Cara Cara navels from my front yard. They got picked off of the tree when they were ripe and she took them home and um, called me back 15 minutes later. And she said, oh my gosh, Greg, what are these? They're incredible. I said, they're car car navels. And she said, but they don't taste like anything in the store. I bet they don't. That's why, you know, they got picked at their peak of ripeness and she took them home and was eating them 15 minutes later. And that's also a nutritional issue as well. They're not as nutrient dense. So we're not getting the level of nutrition that we deserve out of our food either. So by growing your own food, harvesting it when it's ripe, the the amount of nutrition that you're getting is better. Plus, if you're growing it the way I like to grow things, it's organic, so you're not getting any of those yucky chemicals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just for anyone listening um, who doesn't necessarily know my background, because I don't know, by the time Sarah's how much I would have shared, but I grew up in New Jersey and like the farmland portion of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So we always had, you know, fresh corn, um, big corn season, a lot of tomatoes. And yep. for years that you just grew up around it. Also, my parents owned a catering company. So I was just exposed Ooh. to a lot of food and a lot of fresh food. And yeah. that's just kind of what you grow up knowing and not necessarily appreciating. And then I sort of swung in the other direction. Once I got out of my own, I was like, I've done enough healthy eating. And now I'm like, <laughs> and also not necessarily caring about where my food came from, not shopping at farmer's markets, not necessarily caring about sustainability. And now I'm sort of swinging back in the other direction. Mm -hmm. So anyone who's listening is like, I don't even know where to begin. Um, I'm very much on a journey of trying to just make better decisions around where my food's coming from and making better decisions around what's going to affect the planet. And I'm definitely nowhere near being good. Like I still drive an SUV. I still make a lot of bad decisions, but I am trying mm -hmm. to make, take the steps that are moving in the right direction. Yeah. Um, so I do want people who are listening, who are not necessarily very proactive about this to know that like you can make small steps and you can take small steps. You don't need to yeah. necessarily start uh, an urban farm. One of the things that I've done now, which I'm feeling much better about uh, when you reference food miles is that probably 50% of my food that we're consuming is coming from a farmer's market. Oh, so I, I, good for you. Cause there's like great farmer's markets here throughout most there of the year. Is. So, yeah. you know, like I love knowing that my eggs are coming from a farm 30 miles North of here. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and same thing with the chicken and where the, where my lettuce is coming from. So it's great reducing those food miles. Um, and then also hoping that these local farmers, uh, it's the food quality, like you're saying, or the nutritional value is slightly higher as well. Yeah. So I want to start doing more things here, but I live in a condo. Um, Mm -hmm. Do you know what, like, what would be something that's reasonable for, we have a porch in the front, a porch in the back, the porch in the front, right here, great sunlight, but fully exposed to sun throughout the day, porch yeah. in the back, a little bit more protected. Okay. Um, are there so, easy when you're standing on your porch in the front and looking out, what direction are you looking? It's North and South. North so, and South. All right. So yeah. North is going to be pretty much forget about it. Okay. South would be a great place to grow. Have you ever heard of something called a tower garden? 
Uh, yeah. Um, now that I've been like, I was prepping for this interview and looking at more things like this, Facebook is just feeding me with tons of, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. tons of ads so for that. I, I've been growing food in the ground since 1975. I was 15 years old. And in 2010, I discovered so, some one of my friends on Facebook sent me a, a link of a video of this thing called the tower garden. And a tower garden is a hydro, it's essentially a hydroponic growing system that is six feet tall. And when it's completely filled up with food, it, you know, it holds 25 or 30 plants. When it's completely filled up with food growing, it looks like a Christmas tree. And there's a 20 gallon basin in the bottom and uh, the water once a, once an hour for 10 minutes pumps up and hydrates the roots. And I bought one. I pretty much bought one sight unseen because I was so excited about it. And we use, we haven't broken it out here yet because we're still getting our feet grounded here. But from 2010, when I bought it to 2022, when we left, we used it every season. And it's great for growing greens. Um, you know, we grew a lot of our salad greens on it. So, you know, it costs a little bit of money to get in. But the nice thing is, is once you've paid for it, it's paid for itself. And, you know, it just keeps going. And um, so that's one way to do it. Uh, another way is just small pots. Uh, I I lived at the urban farm for 32 years. and uh, back in 2012, uh, for a myriad of reasons, I decided I was going to move out for a year. I rented it to a friend of mine, and I ended up in a little condo out in Peoria for uh, about 10 months. And I put together some raised beds. It was just the back patio was 8 by 10, 80 square feet. And I ran my tower garden in there. And I ran a couple of uh, raised beds and, you know, grew a fair amount of our food. Now, obviously not, you know, when I say a fair amount, I mean like 10 to 30% because a bulk of our food isn't fresh vegetables. You know, we got to have grains and that kind of stuff. And so, uh, but we were growing a lot of things there on this, you know, this 80 square foot back patio that faced south. Yep. Okay. So, yeah. The, b- the big thing is, is to make sure you're planting the, the right thing for the right season. Yeah. I'm definitely going to use that, that, uh, reference that you have on their website. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, no, so I'm really glad you mentioned the tower garden. Cause I've been seeing that. I mean, like you never really know, especially for the amount of investment, like it's fairly expensive. Um, but to have somebody who's actually used one to know that it's worthwhile, I'm like, that's a, that's a, oh, a big help. Big time. Okay. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. I mean, this call alone might be worth it just for, to get that piece of information. Um, yeah. so one of, one other thing that is interesting to me and I think requires more conversation is because this show is largely based around health and healthcare. One of the big things is social determinants of health. Um, mm-hmm. and these are things that like people can't really influence themselves. Uh, a big one of them is like food deserts where I was talking before about, uh, the access problem with food. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like, yeah, you can say that organic freshly grown food is better for people's health, but it's like where if they don't even have access to it, that's not going to be a viable option. Right. So do you see a movement in the future where this this type of farming or this type of food sourcing is going to help alleviate some of those social determinants of health? If people choose it, I have this theory that I developed um, a couple decades ago. Um, I call it my 99-1 theory. 99% of the time people change because they get hit by a metaphorical Mack truck. And 1% of the time they change because they choose to change. Now, COVID was that Mack truck. We sold more fruit trees that year. And I added during, as COVID was hitting, we decided as a team to do um, uh, a free class 
on the internet every day, every weekday. And we did that for like 60 days just on gardening. We were teaching people how to garden and make bread and, you know, whatever it took. We, we were doing that. And we added over 26,000 people to our email list. Wow. That's remarkable. Yeah. And it was that Mack truck moment. Mm -hmm. And so we need to wake up and choose. And I hope it's a lot more than 1% of the time we were choosing to actually grow our own food, but we have some significant food system issues coming down the pike that either going to Mack truck us or we're going to, you know, we're going to work our way through it by growing our own food. So my message with the urban farm podcast is, Hey, it's easy to grow your own food. You can grow it in pots on your front porch, or you can, you know, buy four acres in North Carolina and grow your own food. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question. I kind of went off on a tangent there, but, uh, yeah, you did. And I appreciate you sharing uh, your theory. And I think that theory is correct as well. Um, you can always kind of fudge the numbers a few, a few points in one direction or the other, but exactly. the point remains the same. You mentioned there's a few issues, um, coming down the pike from a food system standpoint. Can you share what some of those are? Well, there's the infrastructure that, um, gets our food to where it's at is getting old. Um, you know, the roadways, the trucks, the systems that are in place. Um, and, and that's a smaller issue. The bigger issue is the health of the food that we're eating. You know, the, a majority of the processed foods aren't good for us. They're impacting our health. They're, you know, it's the, the food's just not good for us. Um, you know, I've seen a lot more posts on Facebook about foods containing, um, you know, GMOs and, you know, that kind of stuff, which we really don't know what that's about and what that's going to do for our health long term. There's uh, the incidence of celiac disease skyrocketed in the early 2000s. And that's when Roundup Ready corn and uh, came on the market and um, you know between the roundup and the bt that they uh, bio add to the corn it's affecting our health so a lot of the and i'll call them manufactured foods a lot of the manufactured foods are just aren't good for our health and so you know we have all kinds of health issues and another theory i have um my mom passed away when she was 85. Uh, this was a couple of years ago and she spent 85 years living here and probably spent 20% of her life in a really polluted world. I've spent half of my life in a really polluted world and I'm starting to see the effects of that, that pollution on my health already. Cause at the age of 62, I'm, starting to experience some of the same kinds of things that my mom was experiencing at 85, 20, 25 years earlier. And then there's our kids, our grandkids, um, you know, anybody in their twenties and thirties has spent their entire life in a really polluted world. And the health issues that we're seeing with them are dramatic. My, a friend of mine's son ended up with celiac disease in, 2002, 2003. And, you know, they, it, it took a, took a quite a bit to figure out what was happening and how to get it fixed. And it doesn't necessarily just have to do with the wheat itself because they're finding that the ancient grains, people eating the ancient grains are less impacted by the gluten in the wheat than people, you know, that are eating processed food. So I think a big, big part of the issue is the processed food piece. Yeah, I think that can't be understated. I was just listening to something with a uh, Gabor Mate, if you know any of his work. Um, he speaks a lot about the idea where 
Um, a lot of people are talking about disease states or mental health conditions, and they're saying they're, these are abnormal conditions. Mm -hmm. But he sort of looks at the environment that we're living in, and he, he posits that this is actually a very normal physiologic response to the environment that we're currently, currently living exactly. in. And that goes largely against the disease state medical model. But mm -hmm. I think he's largely correct. Um, obviously, yeah. it's a very nuanced, large conversation, but it it makes sense. Um, and I'm largely on board with that that line of thinking. Yeah, I would be curious to go on to. I, I want to hear more about why you ended up going to Nash or uh, to Asheville. Did you want to get out of the pollution of a major city and just get more more land? That was a piece of it. The pollution was a piece of it. Um, about 20, 25 years ago, uh, I had conversations, started having conversations with my friends that when my parents passed away, I wanted to go someplace quiet. So I lived in Phoenix for 55 years and Phoenix is a metropolitan area of about 4.7 million people. It's loud, it's polluted. And so I was really interested in finding a quiet place to go. Um, not, not just audibly quiet, but energetically quiet. Um, so that, that was a big piece of it. And another big piece of it was that I wanted to go, go someplace that I could actually grow a significant amount of my own food. And, um, you know, the, the food growing scene here is a bit mind blowing. And I'll specifically say the food growing scene, the food scene, restaurants, it's, you know, this place is amazing for that. But there is an actual nonprofit called ASAP. It stands for Appalachian something. And they started up 22 years ago when the tobacco industry was kind of closing, downsizing. Let me say downsizing. So ASAP started to support local farmers to transition to other food farms to take their, you know, to take their farms into food growing. And I went to their, shortly after I arrived here, I went to their 20th anniversary party and there were hundreds of people there representing hundreds of farms, small farms that people are just growing their own food. In fact, when I was here vetting the house that we uh, ultimately bought um, in December of 21, I saw two different sets of billboards that kind of blew me away. One of them said, get your local, on a billboard, it said, get your local compost from us. And I saw bil multiple billboards for that. And it's like that, for me, that was a clue. And the other th billboard that I saw was download such and such app. It's a local farm app. They have a local farm app for the uh, Asheville area. And it's like, wow. You must love so, being in that kind of community. I do. I do. Yeah, but However, I went from being a, you know, the urban farm and the work that I did in Phoenix was pretty well known. Um, I went from being a really big fish in a really big pond to a really small fish and do a medium sized pond. So I'm, I'm having to relearn a lot. Um, the other thing is, is that there's this thing in growing food called disease pressure. It's the pressure of bugs, of fungus, it's of, you know, just things that negatively impact your plants. And what I've come to find is that the disease pressure in Phoenix is non-existent to the disease pressure here. Just because it's, you know, we get seven inches of rain in Phoenix. We get four, three to five inches of rain a month here. So it's just, it, again, it's, it's a new learning curve. So, um, I want, you know, the, ultimately I wanted to go someplace quiet where I could grow a lot of my own food and start a farm. And that's what we're doing here. We got four acres and we've got our barn that's, uh, getting finished up this weekend. And we put our first greenhouse in about six, eight weeks ago. And uh, well, and this summer I planted 160 fruit tree and berry bushes. Wow. That was a project. Uh, yeah. It sounds like it. That was a project. 
Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. So you're on a third of an acre here in Phoenix. So you have four mm-hmm. acres now. Um, so a lot of fruit trees and bushes. Uh, you've got a greenhouse. What are you growing in the greenhouse? Or what's going to um, be grown there? It'll be for plant starts in January and February. Right now, I'm storing my four citrus trees in there. Okay. Because um, I brought citrus trees with me because I love citrus and it gets too cold for them. And so it's a, it's a place to hold stuff over over the winter. Uh, it's just a teeny one. We got it from Costco. It's uh, seven and a half by eight feet. Okay. So it's just a teeny one. It was like putting Tinker Toys together when we assembled it. Sure. And um, yeah. Uh, do you want to expand at some point in the future? Or are you just going to kind of grow out that space and see what you can make of it? Yeah, I'm just we're just going to grow out this space. And um, so on my podcast, it's the Urban Farm Podcast. Um, I interviewed a year ago, I interviewed a young lady named Samara Price and, um, she's grown, she's got an elderberry product business. So she buys elderberries and uh, processes them into drinks and salves and that kind of stuff. And I said, so where do you get your elderberries at? And she said, oh, I get them here and there, but most of them come out of Europe. That was my response. And my next thing I said was, well, I can grow elderberries for you. I didn't have a clue how to grow elderberries at that moment. But I said, I can grow elderberries for you. So I this was December and January and February. I did some research. I bought 100 elderberry branches. They didn't have any roots. They didn't have any leaves. They didn't have any stem. They were just eight-inch long sticks. And I was told to stick them in the ground. Well, I'm going to do I'm going to do a little better than that. I'd put them in four by four by nine pots. And of those hundred sticks, 98 of them turned into plants. And by June, when I was planting them, they were two feet tall. And by August through the summer, they were three and a half feet tall. So I am in the elderberry growing business. And I currently have about a hundred elderberry plants in the ground. And if I decide to expand the elderberry business, um, I have another three acres that I can plant on. So that so, was that was part of the uh, the summer planting. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. I can imagine. So, um, you know, I'm I'm an entrepreneur. I've had over thirty businesses in my life. Some of them lasted a sneeze. Other of others of them, you know, I have two of them that were. Well, the fruit tree program is twenty four years old, and I had a software company that I ran for twenty years, and. Um, uh, that's just what I am. You know, I'll, I'll be running my own business until I have to take my last breath. So, uh, who knows where that'll lead, but, uh, right now I'm going, I'm getting into the elderberry business. That's great. It offers you a lot of flexibility and freedom. Yep. A lot of work, but you get the, uh, you get the flip side of it, which is I'm sure very rewarding. Yeah. Um, I'm really happy to have had this conversation just because like when I, when I, you said I got a bunch of elderberry sticks, like I would look at that and be like, are these are going to work, but to get a 98%, uh, yeah. you know, success rate. And now they're two feet tall. I'm like, okay, I just need to have a bit more confidence that growing things is going to work. I would just yeah. see a stick and be like, I would think nothing of it. And you, you saw that as an opportunity to grow, uh, what's going to become a hundred elderberry bushes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah well, so. and I, I really encourage you and everybody, you're going to kill plants. I promise you, I, I have I've, killed, I've killed more plenty. plants than you have. Yeah, that's true. I've killed more plants than, cause I've been growing for over, you know, almost 50 years now. I've been, you know, I've killed more plants than anybody listening out there, I guess. And when that Probably. happens, that's a learning lesson. It's not a stop. Yep. Yeah. It's a great you know, point. That's a, oh, okay. I won't do that again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a great point. And will hopefully help shift my mindset around these things. Um, well, plus, plus plants are so resilient. They are. Plants are incredibly resilient you, and, and productive. We, uh, I had a guy that came to the urban farm maybe four or five years ago and I had four ounces of carrot seeds. Four ounces of carrot seeds is 100,000 seeds. Oh, lots okay. of seeds. Yeah. And I asked him if he knew how to plant carrots. He said, oh, yeah. He said, I got it covered. And, you know, what that means is you put in two rows with maybe, uh, you know, 300 seeds. He planted the entire 
bag of, of carrots in my front yard. And when I, har- so we harvested carrots, but then we also harvested carrot seeds. And I ended up with a five gallon bucket of carrot seeds after I processed them. Five gallon bucket. That's, you know, that's like, wow. Yeah. A few million. That's how seeds. productive nature is. Yeah. Despite our best efforts sometimes. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, can you talk about, uh, harvesting rainwater and what gray water harvesting is? Um, I, I'd love to learn more about this. I know that harvesting rainwater in some States is illegal. Uh, we can probably get into that, but just starting off with what, um, what exactly it is, how you do it, how you store it, things like that. Yeah. So for starters, it's actually legal to harvest rainwater in every state. I had um, I had a young lady on my podcast sometime this year, and she had done the research on that. And there are different levels of legality of harvesting rainwater, so you have to check with your state. But it is legal to harvest rainwater in every state. Harvesting rainwater is really paying attention to where the water is on your property when the rain falls and directing it, whether you're directing it into tanks or... Um, into your landscape. And I am a big, big proponent of directing that water in your landscape and then planting the landscape around where you plant the water. So, you know, and I get the question in Arizona, I got the question, well, we only get seven inches of rain a year. Is it worth harvesting the rainwater? Well, yeah, because you only get seven inches of rain. You know, there's, there's that, uh, that huge resource there that, is invaluable in the desert. Of course you want to direct it in your landscape. In fact, back in 2014, I had one rain event. Uh, I think it was September 14th, 2014. I had one rain event where we got 29,000 gallons of water that fell on my third of an acre. It sounds like an inconceivable number. It does. That's like, you know, two Olympic sized pools kind of things fall right. all at once. And, you know, the city of Phoenix was flooding and, and, you know, people were having problems with it. But, you know, my, my property acted like a great big sponge and just sponged it up. And th- the big thing you want to do is in rainwater harvesting is you want to direct the water where you want it in your landscape. And especially in the desert, you direct it where you want it. And then you add lots and lots and lots of woody mulch because the woody mulch acts like a sponge and it sponges up. It holds that water. Okay. Okay. And then gray water harvesting, you have to check with each individual state. In the state of Arizona, it is legal to harvest gray water. Gray water is any water that goes down any drain of your house except your kitchen sink and your toilets. And it is perfectly legal to redirect that gray water out into your landscape. Um, You know, it's a little bit more complicated than what I just made it sound because you need to figure out how to get the water from inside the house to outside the house. And you can do that with plumbing or you can do what I did. And I moved the, uh, a shower outdoor. So I had an outdoor shower at the urban farm and an outdoor kitchen sink so we rinsed our vegetables in it and, you know, basically had a nice sink on the back patio. So that's possible. Yep. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate explaining those, uh, those distinctions and it's good to know that they are, there's some le- level of legality in every state. I think I looked up California and that's where it seemed a little bit iffy. Mm-hmm. Colorado is the, is the most stringent state of them all for rainwater harvesting. For gray water harvesting, I don't know where the where the other states are at on that. Okay. All right. Well, everyone listening, uh, do your own research on that one. Um, can you describe like where you think the the trajectory of our food systems are going to be maybe a decade or two from now? Just getting an understanding of like the level of urgency required, maybe. Well, I think that you know, with where we're at right now, we'll get some people growing food. And other people not. And I think that if the Mack truck arrives, then we'll get a lot more people growing food. Um, my hope is, is that we can get, you know, our neighborhoods growing food. Um, you know, in, in the case of a major shutdown, 
you know, if I'm the only one growing food on my street, then I become a target. You know, people are going to come and say hi and want to buy food from me or want to take food from me. Um, but if I can get my neighbors and friends, uh, just like when I was in Croatia, if we can get, you know, if we can get everyone growing food in their yards, then um, we're in a lot better shape. Do you have hope for regenerative farming? Like it seems maybe it's just because I'm becoming more interested in it and I'm looking up more of these things online. So I'm getting more of like a positive feedback loop of what's being shown to me on social media and through search engines. It seems like I'm seeing more about regenerative farming and that seems like a hopeful avenue, but I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are on that for like a, from a sustainability standpoint. It's, it's the only place we have, we can go. The, the corporate food system um, is tenuous at best at this moment, just because of everything going on it. And it's using up the soil. I did want to talk about soil. Yep. Yeah. Um, and we'll talk about healthy soil hacked here in a minute. Um, but regenerative farming is really about building healthy soil. That's the, the key line of it is, you know, building healthy soil, uh, because healthy soil has lots of organic matter in it and lots of life in it. And that makes the food more nutrient dense. It makes our plants grow better. Um, if I can pontificate a little bit here, there's five components to healthy soil. Yeah. Let's talk and, about it. Yeah. Um, and in order, when we have healthy soil, the plants are going to grow better. The food's going to be healthier for us. The five components are airspace, water, dirt. And in the desert, what we have primarily is dirt. Dirt is broken down rock. And if all you have is dirt in your backyard, it's highly compacted. The water can't get in and it's lacking organic matter. So what makes healthy soil is um, uh, water, airspace, dirt, organic matter, and everything that's alive in the soil, the microorganisms and the bugs and that kind of stuff. and so when they talk about good, healthy soil to grow food in, you've got a good balance of those five components. The easy thing is, and the cool thing is, is that to fix dirt or an unhealthy soil, you just add lots of organic matter. You can add it as compost. You can add it as woody mulch that eventually breaks down into really healthy soil. And um, I've put together, uh, I've put together a series of, of uh, videos and stuff called healthy soil hacked and you can find that at healthy soil hacked.com it's a free series um it's uh it goes deeper into the five components of healthy soil i got a video on that um i did a process in permaculture permaculture i like to call the art and science of working with nature and uh in permaculture they do something called sheet mulching there's actually a book on the market called lasagna gardening. So that kind of gives you an idea of what it is. You're, you're laying down a layer of browns and then you put a little bit of manure on top of that and then more browns. And you can, you know, you can make this 24 or 36 inches thick. And over the course of six months, it'll break down to two or three inches of healthy soil. It's a quick way to get really healthy soil growing. Um, and then uh, it also, the healthy soil hacked. Dot com also includes a video of me putting in a garden for less than a hundred bucks, a raised bed garden in the desert. So great. We're definitely going to link to that in the show notes as well. Um, I'm also going to check that out. Uh, cool. I was, I wanted to know about soil because I know monocropping is largely, it's just extracting so mm -hmm. much and it, yeah. it's just like, it's so, such a large swaths of land that are just becoming the soil is just not good anymore. And that's coming through in our food system as well. So the, whatever's, exactly. being, whatever's being grown there is just not as nutritious because the soil's not as good. Yes. Do you know anything about the carbon capture um, related to healthy soil versus like what monocrop soil is? I heard somebody I have, on a podcast years ago and it mm -hmm. was like the difference, like a lot of 
climate change, maybe not a lot, but a significant portion um, of climate change, or at least the carbon issue, can be solved if we just start regenerating our soil. Yes. Yeah. I don't know the facts on this. Um, I know that Maria Rodale from the Rodale Institute um, wrote a book on it a few years ago. Um, And I know she's on a book tour right now, so maybe you can get her on your podcast. I will look her up. Um, Yeah, Maria Rodell, um, Organic Manifesto, that was the book. And she actually did the numbers to address how much carbon gets captured when you're growing healthy soil. So I know it's significant. Yeah. I just don't know. I don't know the numbers on it. Yeah. I remember it being uh, when I heard it. And this is before I really was paying attention to climate change or anything like that. It mm-hmm. seemed like, oh, this seems like a very, very viable solution. But that was five or six years ago, and I just haven't looked into it since. Um, but I know, I know, generally speaking, mm-hmm. healthy soil is a good thing for our planet. Oh, big time. Big um, time. It, are there going to be enough regenerative farms? Like, can we get away as a country? Regenerative farming? Like, can we produce and produce enough food that way? I say yes. Again, I don't have the facts on it, but um, it, it's amazing the amount. So remember I called the urban farm an old growth food forest earlier in the call. It's amazing to me the amount of abundance that can grow just wild in a space. I mean, in many cases, the landscape that I had at the urban farm in Phoenix was a foraging space. It was all stuff that I'd planted over the prior 20 or 30 years, but I would just go forage in the, in the yard. And um, so if we stop this obsession with lawns and I have a rule in my world that I don't plant things that don't make food. You know, if you're going to have a landscape, you might as well plant landscape plants that make food for you. And, you know, that's what I did in Phoenix. And, I mean, even if you want to go with a desert landscape in Phoenix, there is a textbook size book on edibles of the Sonoran Southwest. There's cactuses and, you know, we, in Phoenix every year, we, since about 2006, we do a mesquite bean uh, pod Uh, milling where we do education to teach people about harvesting mesquite beans and then they can bring their beans that they've harvested and get them milled from us and it's a highly nutritious dense flower that comes from them that's that's sweet my partner Heidi um, uses mesquite flour instead of sweeteners in some of her yeah, it's that sweet. Interesting. I so, did see that. I saw that video of yours on uh, yeah. I think it was on YouTube. So, for for people listening, I'm very new to like trying to live more sustainably and I'm admittedly not doing as well as I want to, but I'm trying to be kind with myself and just say we're making steps in the right direction. Yep, there you go. So, that's what that's all you can do. Right, cuz like everyone's busy. It it's so hard to add new habits to your life. Yeah. Um, and I understand that. Um, I totally get it. I just, I try a bunch of things and then six months later, I'm like, well, these eight didn't stick, but at least I'm still doing these two. So yeah, I'm trying to be exactly. happy about that. So for people who aren't necessarily ready to make drastic changes and maybe start urban farming, do you have any tips or can you just run through things that you do to try to make a positive impact from a sustainability or from a climate change standpoint? Not necessarily as advice, but just throwing ideas out there that people can possibly yeah. latch on to be like, oh, I could maybe try doing that. Anything yeah. like that, would, I think it'd be very helpful. Yeah. So number one, find your local farmer's market. Go hang out at your local farmer's market. It's fun to hang out at it. Buy things from the local farmer's market. Um, buy things that are grown locally. That you know, That's the easiest thing to do. Just figure out who your farmer is. Um, and then the next step is, you know, get a pot, you can put a pot on a front porch and, uh, you know, grow some lettuce. Heidi used to Heidi, my partner, Heidi used to grow lettuce in a pot on the front porch of the urban farm, you know, and just, and the, the cool thing about lettuce and spinach and those kinds of things, it's, it grows 
in, in a method called cut and come again. And so, you know, as the lettuce plant is growing up, you're harvesting this, the leaves on the outside and it keeps growing up and you harvest more leaves. And so it's, it's an ongoing harvest. So, you know, just jumping in with a pot or two on your front or back porch is super simple as well. Mm -hmm. One of the things I started doing uh, was just trying to be more conscious of the the amount of waste or food waste I was producing in a given There's week. That too, yep. Like it's so embarrassing to say, especially like you know, I'd be fine just saying this in like a conversation to one person, but you just put this out there to the internet. Where for so many years, I would just take stuff to the dumpster or the trash mm-hmm. can, and truly, mm-hmm. I thought that as far as my consciousness went, I'm like, that's where it ended, right? I'm like, it's just out of my hand, out of sight. I'm like, yep. that's just where it ends. And it's so silly to think that at 34, I was like, oh, this really goes somewhere afterwards. Right. Like, I, like I knew that intellectually, yeah. but I didn't like not in a conscious way where I'm like, I should do something about it. Yeah. So that's one of those things I have to pay attention to. I'm like, oh, all of this has to go somewhere. And I right. try very hard now, still not perfect, but of any food that we buy, really try to use it, get creative with meals, eat things that don't necessarily make sense together. But if it's, if I think you're going to end up throwing it out, try, try to eat it. And so there is no way I, you know, that's something I learned from Brad Lancaster 20 plus years ago. There's no way, you know, when you throw something away, it, it doesn't. Yeah. And um, another thing on the food waste. So, um, one of the things that I do as we're prepping meals here, if there's ends of carrots and celery and onions and just leftover parts that you would normally throw away, first of all, I compost them. But secondly, what I do is I'll take the stuff that's still good and I'll stick it in a gallon jar and stick it in the freezer. And when I get enough of that stuff, then I pull it all out of the freezer and I stick it in a pot and boil it and get my own um, vegetable broth. You know, because you're going to, if you make soup, you use vegetable broth in the soup and, you know, you can buy it in boxes at the store or you can make your own. So there's creative things that you can do with that food waste. Um, and so from the regenerative perspective, let's just cover that real quick. Regenerative is a circular. Yep. Okay. Yeah. It's probably and great if, if anyone listening doesn't know what it is, can you quickly describe what like a regenerative farm looks like? Yeah. So great. So I had at the urban farm, a regenerative composting system set up and I was actually harvesting 10 buckets of food waste, pre-consumer food waste. So they'd make their salads and there would be leftover stuff and, and it would go in buckets. And I was harvesting 10 five gallon buckets a week from this restaurant. First of all, I got a lot of food grade buckets. And secondly, um, I got all this food waste and that food waste came up the driveway of my house along with the food waste, any food waste that was left over in the kitchen at the urban farm. And it went multiple places in my yard. So first of all, the chickens love the food waste. Um, in fact, if you have a backyard, you should have chickens. You have three or four hens. Um, they give you eggs. They are great diggers. They uh, give you fertilizer for your garden. Um, and they eat your food waste. And yeah. Um, and you know, if you're really bold and want to jump in this, and I've done this before, I raised meat birds and butchered my own chickens about 15 years ago at the urban farm, just to see what, you know, what's that process like. So now I am comfortable processing my own chickens. So the food waste comes up the driveway. It, uh, goes to the chickens for food. Um, I was doing worm composting as well at the urban farm. And that's the kind of composting I do here. And worm compost is the best. They call it gardener's gold worm castings. It's some of the best stuff you can get for your garden. Um, and then anything that I had left over went into the compost bins. So back to regenerative part, I have this food waste coming in either from our kitchen or leftover stuff in the yard or the stuff from the restaurant, and I'm turning it into chicken eggs and chicken poop. 
um, worm poop, which is great fertilizer for the garden or compost. And that was all going into our garden beds to make healthier soil, to grow healthier food that we were then harvesting and had some pieces left over on it, which then went back into the system. So that's the circular, circular part of regenerative. And that is my regenerative composting system. Regenerative farming is a bit more complicated and there's lots written on it, but in big part, it's just about working with natural systems to grow food. Yeah. Like uh, the way I've understood it, maybe as a very simple framework for anyone who still doesn't know, uh, just to think about it, it's like if you have grown uh, some sort of crop on a certain plot of land, that crop's going to extract a certain amount of nutrients out of the soil. Mm-hmm. You can maybe do a certain number of seasons, um, but then you're going to want to rotate. So if you have livestock yep. or chickens or pigs, I think are very good at like tearing up the dirt. Chickens yep. are good at scratching and they'll eat a lot of the bugs in there. And then you want to get their waste product to, again, you said uh, organic matter, like putting yeah. that organic matter back into the soil. So then you're, you're using, and you're basically just rotating uh, plots of land for, mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's sort of the, the circuitous, uh, yeah. process that you were describing. Joel Salatin has written, done a lot with regenerative farming and written a lot of books about regenerative farming. And, um, yeah, it's, it's the way to go. Yep. I first got into that by buying, I wanted to start buying better sources of meat a few mm-hmm. years ago. So I just mm-hmm. started looking into, um, regenerative farms that had, yeah. Yeah, cattle. Um, so that's how I got into it. So for people who want to be more proactive, what are there any things that you can suggest? Cause you've clearly been involved with this for a long time, not only at the individual level, but you've clearly started businesses out of this, uh, community involvement. What else can people do if they want to be more, more proactive than just starting to, you know, take small steps kind of like I'm doing to be a little bit more sustainable and help the planet. If you want to get a little more aggressive and you have the time, like what, what can other people do? Yeah. Um, well, the, you know, we already talked about farmer's market and then there's growing your own, figure out how to, you know, take a gardening class. There's the master gardener program in most cities. Um, there's our course called growing food, the basics, which, um, it'll teach you everything you need to know in order to grow your own food and, and get real clear where your food's coming from. That's, that's a big piece of it. Um, I've said for years that uh, the most important thing we can be doing right now is understanding where our food comes from and how to grow our own. Yep. That definitely makes sense. Um, one of the things that I think I convinced myself of for a long mm-hmm. time when thinking about climate change and things like that is like, there's going to be some unbelievable technological breakthrough that'll just figure this out. Like some sort of technology will just figure out carbon capture and Mm -hmm. we'll just solve it that way. Do you have any hope that that is going to be the case or is it going to be like, it's going to be just people making better decisions for the planet? Um, I don't think technology is the capital T solution. I think it's part of the solution. Uh, And um, it's going to require a lot of, all the way across the scale from technology to, you know, just growing food in your front and backyard. That makes sense. For a long time, I think I was kind of resistant to um, anything around sustainability or climate change because I was like, I'm one person. How much of a difference can I really make? Like I, like I knew the information on like the biggest carbon producers and it's some astronomically high number of, the carbon emissions are produced by like the 75 biggest companies in the world or corporations in the world. So I'm like, why am I going to bother when I'm clearly not making a dent? I've kind of come around to understanding that the decisions you make from a consumer standpoint are largely going to be reflective of, um, kind of your mentality. Um, so that's, so that's largely, again, it, it seems, it seems like not enough. But I do think like getting more people to be conscious with their purchasing power um, about what they're doing, where their money's going will make a difference. Um, yeah. Do you have any Big other, time. do you have any other advice around that, around like how to shift your mindset? Because it does seem like there's, there's apathy 
when it comes to this because it's such a massive problem. Mm -hmm. And you're like, how much can one person really do? So anything you can speak to that'll help help with people's mindset around feeling like you feel feeling like you can't actually make a difference. Yeah. For me, it goes back to my 99 one theory. We have to choose to change. And, um, you know, I was at, (laughs) I was at, um, a coffee house maybe three or four years ago. It was early on a, on a morning and I was, uh, I'm always chirpy happy. It was like seven 30. And there was this woman in front of me and, uh, she turned around and looked at me and she said, why are you so happy? I said, well, I have a choice every morning when I get up to be happy or not. And I choose happy. And you know what she said to me? Get over it. And so I, a big piece of it is, is, you know, choose, you have a choice. The power of your thinking is huge. Choose, choose to be happy, choose to grow your own food, choose to, you know, I there's so with my fruit tree program in Phoenix, I still do education every year. We've been doing it for 24 years and then people can get fruit trees from us out of our program. And what started happening with my team about six or seven years ago um, was I would say something and it would happen. And so my team started calling me out on it. It's like, oh my gosh, Greg, you said this the other day and look, this happened. I don't have any examples off the top of my head right now, right now but just little things. It's like, you know, we, we need to get rid of all of these pomegranates. So let's set an intention to get rid of the pomegranates and boom, they're gone. And your, your brain has an amazing ability to create in the world. And those come from your thoughts. So what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, it's a great point. It's one of those things where for a long time, I kind of worshiped at the altar of like science and logic and mathematics and stuff like that. But Mm -hmm. I'm coming around to the idea. I'm like, there's a lot of stuff that happens in the world that I can't necessarily explain or quantify, or there's not a double blind RCT proving it. But yeah, a lot of your thoughts and intentions, uh, the word manifestation come, comes up a lot, but a lot of those things where if you just put these thoughts and ideas and energy towards a certain outcome, mm-hmm. it certainly helps that outcome become reality. So there's, I think there is something that you can certainly influence reality yeah. with, with cool. your intentions and your thoughts and your energy. And, and here's another piece of this. What do you stand for? You know, in 1991, I did a lot of work around an organization called Landmark Education, and they had, uh, they have something called their advanced course. And in their advanced course, they have you s- create a vision for your life. Like, what are you up to in the world? Now, this was 32 years ago that I created my vision for my life. And it sounds like this. I'm the person on the planet responsible for transforming our global food system. You saw how easy that came. It's who I am in the world. Now, am I going to transform our global food system on my own? No. But that's the intention which I live by. It's what gets me up in the morning. It's what has me plant a hundred elderberries, you know, just out of nowhere to become an elderberry farmer. Um, it's what had me, um, start growing in my front and backyard when I was, I went back to Arizona State University as an undergraduate when I was 40. And so from the time I was 40 to the time I was 43, I was farming my front and backyard. And once a week I would go out and harvest what was growing there and I would go to the farmer's market and I would sell it. So, you you know, it goes back to your mind has power. What are you doing with your thoughts? And what is your intent? And if your intent is, that's what you're going to get. And if your intent is, oh my gosh, you know, I sent an intention in 1991 to meet my perfect partner. And it took me from 1991 till 
2013 when I met her on Valentine's Day, by the way, not on purpose. And we've been together now for, you know, coming up on 11 years and it's amazing, but it came from, I'll take responsibility for that. It came from my intention, from my setting the intention that this is the way it's going to be. And magic happens when you're positive and happy. In fact, when you come and interact with us at our fruit tree program, people often tell me it's like Christmas. I bet it is. I yeah. bet it's it's one of those things that I, I think probably resonates with so many people at a very intrinsic level. Um, and it's just one of those things that's not readily available. Um, yeah. I, I think there's something like very natural within us that like our hand should be in soil. We should be sort of, there's something around like working the land that is just yep. kind of within us. Yeah. Do you do you enjoy the manual labor, the manual side I do. of things? I bet. Oh, I do. Because I sit in front of with my podcast and the videos that I do. I sit in my in front of my computer way too much. Yeah. So getting out and planting trees, digging holes, building a greenhouse, is fun. Yep. It's got to be a really nice balance for you. Yeah. Um. One last thing. Uh, I had one other question. I was like, Are you optimistic about the future? I think you just answered that with the uh the whole mindset thing. Yeah. I think uh it will depend on everyone's individual mindset, but. I'm- I'm optimistic in many ways and the ecological systems of this planet are significantly stressed and that has me concerned and I still carry, I still carry this stuff like this. You know, I put out my hand and say, you know what, you can grow your own food. Look at this, check this out. And then I, I don't throw it at people. I kind of, you know, it's like, come and check this out. This is fun. Mm-hmm. You can grow your own food. Yeah, people have to want it. Yeah. Do you have a uh, Do you have a closing message you can leave everyone with? Um, learn about permaculture and implement it in your life, and um, have fun. If you're not having fun, why bother? If you're in a job that you hate. Why bother? Go out and create happy and fun in your life and it will change your world and it'll change the world. I love it. I really appreciate this conversation. Uh, I have lots of notes for things that we're going to link to in the show notes. We're going to link to your podcast. We'll link to your website. Um, All the resources mentioned throughout the show we'll link as well. Um, Nice. Greg, thanks so much for coming on. This is a a real pleasure to have this chat with you. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. Hey everyone, that's all for today's show. I want to thank you so much for stopping by and watching, especially if you've made it all the way to this point. If you'd like to be notified when new episodes are going to be released, feel free to subscribe and make sure you hit the bell button as well. To learn more about today's guest, feel free to look in the description. You can also visit the podcast website, which is exploringhealthpodcast.com. That website will also be linked in the description. As always, likes, shares, comments are a huge help to me and to this channel and to the show. So any of that you can do, I would really appreciate. And again, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.